If you're seriously into anime, and why wouldn't you be, it's fucking awesome, no doubt you have heard of the big three at Shonen Jump. The big three refers to the three of the biggest shonen mangas running on Shonen Jump during the late 90s and early 2000s. Naruto, One Piece, and Bleach. I never fucked with One Piece during that time period, my jams were Naruto and Bleach. Unfortunately, I had lost touch with Bleach during the Hyo Commando arc, as it started to feel like Bleach was treading water at that point. But of the big three mangakas, I prefer Taito Kube the most. His art has a sense of cool and style that is rare in shonen, long flowing strokes and moody atmospheres with utilization of negative space. Kubu Sensei made the panels of Bleach look so fucking stylish. It's his characterization that let me down? Oh, uh, okay. That's not quite fair, it's the nature of Shonen and how long he carried on with Bleach that let me down. Even till today, I don't believe Kubo Sensei had any more in the tank beyond the Gote 13 or the Soul Society arc. That was the pinnacle of Bleach and the height of his powers as a writer and an artist. The rest of it was retroactive writing and making it up as he went along, but enough about Bleach. As legendary as it was, we are here because after almost 4 years, we got a new anime from Taito Kube and it's called Burn the Witch. And today, I'm going to tell you if it's worth your time. Burn the Witch is Taito Kubo's newest work. It was first published in Weekly Shonen Jump as a one-shot chapter in July 2018. Following that, it was confirmed as a mini-series with four chapters, and soon after it was adapted into a movie by studio called Rido. The movie came out on October 2nd in Japan, and for the international release, the movie was restructured into three episodes and released on various streaming platforms. Following that, we also know that the manga has been given a second season. No, not the anime. The manga has received a second season and will continue the story. The movie slash anime series will adapt the first four chapters of the manga, but does not adapt the one shot, which is a shame because there is a metric fuck ton of lore in the one shot. So, to recap, one shot was published, followed by serialization of four more chapters to so in total five chapter mini series. That mini series minus the one shot was adapted into a movie, which is broken down into three episodes for release outside of Japan. A second season was greenlit for the manga. We caught up? Cool? Cool. So what should you do if you want to experience Burn the Witch? Well my recommendation would be to read the manga and then watch the show. The one shot is a lot more world building and information that the series does not have and as such it gives you a better idea of the world in which Burn the Witch operates in. In this video I'll be going into spoilers at a certain point, but till I point that out it is relatively spoiler free. So keep watching till I yell out spoiler alert or something. Then backflip out of here to go watch the show or read the manga then come back and watch the rest of the video. In short, Burn the Witch is set in Reverse London, which is a city that exists underneath Front London or Real London. Dragons are a danger to the people of London, with 72% to be oddly exact of all deaths in the city being dragon related. The hidden side of London, Reverse London, is a community involved with controlling the dragon population. Reverse London and Front London are linked, so any property damage that takes place in Reverse London is reflected in Front London. The people born in Front London cannot see dragons, only people born in Reverse London can see and interact with dragons. Well, mostly. We'll get to that later. Luckily, the British Dragon Hunting Agency of Reverse London, Wingbind, exists to conserve and manage the creatures, as well as protect humans from falling foul of them. Our central protagonists are two of Wingbind's finest, the hotshot witch duo of Noel Nihashi and Nini Spanko. Dressed in school uniforms and zooming around on their own dragon versions of broomsticks, the pair very much fit the young, fun spin that audiences weaned on Sabrina and Charmed have come to expect from modern day witches in the media. They work for the Piper Division of Wingbind, who were essentially dragon shepherds or wranglers basically. This makes the tools they use to subdue rogue dragons a little more interesting than your standard sword, energy beam, or just plain fists. As the designation suggests, they use pipe infused with magic which also kind of work like guns, holsters and all. The Wingbind organization is a society of wizards and witches authorized to deal with any dragon related issues in Reverse London. They are also authorized to arrest any human who breaks the law against being around a dragon without proper clearance or protective garb. The mages of Wingbind are compensated for the missions they complete with cash payment but also earn points for outstanding achievement. Noel has said that she's in this line of work for the money, but Nini makes plenty of cash from her job in a band, so she's after the points. 
With enough points, a wizard or a witch can likely receive a promotion. This competence and devil may care attitude of Noel and Nini is counterbalanced by Balgo, a blonde haired buffoon whose dragon clad status makes him a magnet for the creatures. Like most of the Wingbind staff and citizens that the witches encounter, Balgo is enamored by Noel, the cooler, more collected counterpart to Nini, who fulfills the brash little sister role. Both are distinct but equally engaging personalities, and it's a rare treat to watch a shonen offshoot starring not one, but two female characters. Equally distinctive are the series' dragons, who come in various shapes, sizes, and temperaments. One near the star that Noel engages in the countryside that looks like a deer, while the huge white one that goes on the rampage as a dark dragon in Reverse London bears a resemblance to How to Train Your Dragon's Night Furies. So those are your three central characters, Noel, Nini, and Balgo. The series tells the story of one of their adventures, of hopefully many more. Kuba has always had beautiful and distinct character designs and it's on full display here. Every character is beautifully designed and the little touches on their costumes make each character stand out from each other. Each character has a sense of style that represents their personality. Noel has a little horn on the side of her head and wears her hair down straight. And Nini wears her hair up into ponytails with red horns holding her wayward hair in place, playing off of Noel's calm demeanor and Nini's wild nature. In front London, Nini's a pop star, where she dresses like one, and she's hounded by the paparazzi all the fucking time. The character design is further emphasized with the introduction of the controlling board of Wingbind, the top of horns. The most attention-grabbing character designs of the show would have to be the men and women who control it. Each one of them more distinct from the other, they are a joy to analyze and understand. I'll get to them when I get in the spoiler part of this video. The animation on the show makes it look like an edgy Ghibli movie, and that's a great thing. The color palette and the dragons all add up to the feeling that you're watching a Taito Kube directed Ghibli movie. Winds flowing over the girls as they ride the dragons, the city lights, the green pastures, all very reminiscent of Ghibli movies to me. Studio Colorado has done an amazing job and the show looks spectacular. But the story is very interesting with a metric fuckton of lore behind it. The animation is amazing and the character design is top notch. It's certainly worth the watch to see what one of the best mangakas in the world has to offer to us right now. So it is at this point I'm going to go into full spoiler territory in discussion. So if you haven't seen the show or read the manga, please pause the video and go watch the show. Then come back and we can chat some more. Cool? Cool. I'm sure all of you watching already knew this, but Burn the Witch is a Bleach spin-off. It takes place 12 years after the Thousand Year Blood War arc in Bleach and 2 years from the ending of Bleach. Wingmind is basically the western chapter of Soul Society and here, instead of fighting and cleansing hollows, they fight and conserve dragons. Essentially, dragons are burned the witch's version of hollows. Kubo's love for creating super teams has not abandoned him. After giving us Gote 13, the Aaron Cars, the Espadas and even the Fullbringers and the Quincy's, my man just loves his organograms. So similar to Soul Society East that we're familiar with, the Top of Horns are Soul Society West version of Gote 13. Wingbind is divided into 8 divisions, each with their own different responsibilities that are led by directors comprising of the top forms. The 8 divisions are, in order, number 1, Inks. The Inks, or Magic Circle Core, are led by Bruno Bangknife. They're tasked with exterminating dark dragons and fight primarily with powerful magic. Inks wear baggy, dark colored hoodies and sweatpants with zippers and have the ability to shield themselves with magic. They're represented by the zodiac symbol Taurus. Number 2. Anthems. The Anthems, or the Incantation Course, are led by Roy B. Dipper. They are represented by the Zodiac symbol Capricorn. Number 3. Sacreds. The Sacreds, or the Liturgy Corps, are led by Quintar Meliv. I'm sorry for the pronunciations. They are represented by the Zodiac symbol Aquarius. Number 4. The Pipers. The Pipers of the Ministerial Course, also known as the Conservation Rangers, are led by Tronbone Takinen and oversee the domestication of dragons and help harvest the resources they produce. In addition to apprehending illegally reared dragons, Noel Nihashi and Nini Spankol are both part of this division. Billy Banks Jr. is their commanding officer, having recently been demoted from his position in the Sabres. They are represented by the zodiac symbol Aries. Number 5. Sabres The Sabres of the Tactical Corps are led by Sullivan Square and patrol the streets of London to protect its citizens from dragons. They are represented by the zodiac symbol Scorpio. Number 6. Patchworks The Patchworks of the Development Corps are led by Sakarin, who we don't get to see because she was absent or he was absent. They are charged with collecting and preserving the corpses of dragons. Number 7. Billionaires 
The billionaires are accounting course are led by Harry Sheik. They're represented by the zodiac symbol Leo. Number 8. Gallows. The Gallows or Personal Affairs Divine Punishment Squad are led by Wolfgang Slashot. They're represented by the zodiac symbol Libra. As you can see, each member of the top of forms has a unique design and personality, but through this story, we're actually introduced to only two of them, Bruno Bangknife and Sullivan Square. Bruno gets most of the screen time because the story basically revolves around him trying to kill Balgo Parks, because, well, Balgo is a dragon clan. Alright, we didn't talk about dragon clans. So, basically the deal is this. Humans aren't allowed to come in contact with dragons for prolonged periods or any period basically. When humans come in contact with dragons, a chemical starts to build up in their bodies, called dragotoxin. When enough of the chemical is built up in your body, you end up becoming a dragon clad. And when one becomes a dragon clad, their body basically becomes dragon bait, as it attracts the most powerful of dragons. And there are two types of dragons, light dragons and dark dragons. Dark dragons are light dragons that have absorbed negative human emotion and are actively trying to kill anyone and everything. Anyone who has come in contact with the dragon is imprisoned for 100 years or executed. Balgo has been in contact with the dragon for 10 years and therefore he's more dragon than human at this point and as such cannot be subject to human laws and therefore is placed under the care of the Pipers, a la Noel and Nini. The details of how and why Balgo was in contact with the dragon for 10 years is covered in the first one shot and not covered by the anime so I'm leaving that out. If you do want to know just comment below and tell you that story too. Or you can know, you can read the one shot. Cool? Cool. Right. So, as the anime starts, Balgo attracts a dark dragon into the middle of London, which is the first sighting of a dark dragon in 96 years, and that raises the questions of whether or not he should be allowed to live. And the top of horns decides, nope, not having any of that, that's off that do. So Bruno takes it upon himself to go kill Balgo, which puts him directly at odds with her intrepid heroines. Meanwhile, at the beginning of the show, we are told that Nini's band Cecile Die Twice just broke up in front London. And one of her former bandmates is Mary Baljour, who by Nini's own admission is in love with her. Remember this, this will be important later. So back to Bruno trying to kill Balgo. Nini and Noel are asked to go take care of someone illegally raising a dragon in London by their boss and that they'll be rewarded with 5 times the money and the achievement points for doing the deed. But they need to take Balgo along with them and make him wear a piper's uniform and carry a fake ass pipe. So far so shady, you just know that that was the plan to get him killed. As soon as they reach the mission location, an explosion takes place at a building housing a tabloid The Realists. Nini and Noel go there and find Nini's ex-bandmate Marcy in the building, the one we talked about before. And she has a dragon with her. For the sake of brevity, the backstory here is Marcy felt like shit and not special as a person but she loves Nini. One day, two months ago, she came in contact with Balgo in front London and that made her into a light dragon clad. Consequently, on her walk home, she found a baby dragon. She named it Ellie. No one in front London could see Ellie and her being able to see Ellie made Marcy feel special, like she was a princess in a fairy tale. This is where I start to see Soul Society arc Kubo shine through, his knack for making relationships and believable characters. All Marcy ever wanted to be was special and be noticed. Even when she was in a band, Marcy was a depressed woman who struggles to find a purpose in her life and desired to feel special. Having never felt comfortable in Cecile die twice, she only stayed because Nini was there and because she would have lost all recognition had she left. However, this changed when she found an infant dragon, whom she took home to raise and feels gives her strength with the ultimate goal of taking her someplace special one day. Remember this fairy tale angle, this will also be important later. So it turns out this was all planned out by Bruno Bangknife. What a fucking badass name though. Bruno bought Marcy from front London because A, even though she was not born in reverse London, she can see dragons and that means she's full of magical powers and is, this is a technical term, a watcher. And B, as a distraction for Nini, while well, Bruno can go about his goal of killing Balgo. Things escalate as Nini and Noel escape with Balgo and Marcy in full defiance of a top of Horns member. Wanted to save their friend and they decide to stand up to the system and to Bruno and after a short skirmish, they take off. Bruno summons his dragon Rickenbacker and gives chase, eventually catching up to them and is consequently attacked himself by Ellie. Ellie injures Rickenbacker and takes off into the moonlight to molt as she sheds off her skin and grows in size and shape turning into a majestic dragon we find out she is a goddamn Martian. Ancient dragons rumored to have existed even before the formation of Reverse London, the Martian are the progenitors of dark dragons and are permanently authorized for elimination due to being designated as wicked dragons and humanity's hypothetical enemy. There are only seven in existence, Snow White, Red Dress, Golden Axe, Bubbles, Sugar House, Band of Animals and our very own Ellie, or as she is called in legend, Cinderella. Let's talk about Bruno for a second. 
Not only is designed like a cool as fuck badass motherfucker, I love his character. He comes off as brash, cocky, willing to take out anyone that stands in his way. But then he has the softer side too, which we see when he interacts with his own dragon, Rickenbacker. Rickenbacker is a blue dragon with four wings, and Cinderella takes off one of her wings. And as Bruno puts on a fucking skull mask and somehow becomes even cooler, he asks Rickenbacker if three wings would be enough for a fight with this dragon of legends. And she nods, I got your back, bro. And my heart fucking melted. Bruno is so cool. Hashtag bang knife Rickenbacker. As Bruno charges into battle, we see the battle system of the inks come into play. He carries around spray paint cans on a utility belt and uses them to draw sigils and releases different magic spells. It's such a cool looking battle system, it's also very different from how the pipers use their spells and makes me really want to see how the different divisions each use their techniques. As Nini and Noel join Bruno in the fight against this frankly quite beautiful dragon, who by the way can release a dust called Star Ash, each of which is a bomb that explodes on contact. We see Bruno accept the girls for who they are. They take the fight to Cinderella, who knocks the girls away back to where they left Marcy and Balgo. And this is when the story takes another turn, as Balgo somehow turns the fake pipe he was holding into a sword. Kubo lays another thread for us to explore later. Cinderella bears down on the group, ignoring Bruno and tries to take the girls and their friends out. As they put up barrier spells, Marcy pleads with Nini not to kill Cinderella, that there must be another way. And she tries to get Cinderella to recognize her, but it doesn't work. And the story takes us to Nini's monologue at the beginning of the show. Iron fairy tale just full of it. Girl gets hit by a magic spell, turns into a princess, gets to wear a pretty dress, gets to make believe she's picking out some hot guy, but ends up getting chosen herself instead. And the magic disappears part way through to boot. Isn't that just the worst? But everyone says they want to be the princess. Are they for real? They know that the spell's gonna wear off in the middle of things, right? You broke a promise? So? Oh well. Time's up, so you're out of luck? Think again, you're all a bunch of idiots. None of you have any idea what the spell actually wears off. If idiots are the only ones who get bewitched, I'd rather be the one casting the spell. Nini brings this back full circle as he says to Marcy. Marcy, we are the one who casts the magic, aren't we? I believe this is the central theme of the story, reality versus fairy tale. Except reality in this case itself is a world full of magic and dragons, so it's Kinda meta, I guess? But the idea is that we should be in control of our lives. We should be the ones deciding what our lives mean, what we stand for. We should be the ones casting the spells. And I believe it's a strong message from a Taito Kubo story. Since the last protagonist was a reactionary one, it's very nice to see his current heroine being an active protagonist. Overall, I loved this show. Absolutely riveting and kept me hooked throughout. I cannot wait to see more of this world and more of this story. Kubo has laid the groundwork for so many plot threads that can take the story in so many interesting ways. The show is full to the brim with interesting characters and Kubo's strength of making interesting characters was always evident and he brings that to full bear here. His art is phenomenal in the manga but it's translated even better in the anime and I cannot wait to watch more of the story. If you're still here, first of all, thank you very much for listening to me blabber on about this anime. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, there are other videos on this channel on similar topics that you can check out. I hope you consider hitting the subscribe button, it really helps me out. If you already are subscribed, thank you very much. Hit that like button if you like this or even the dislike button. Whatever you do, I'm cool with it. I'm just glad you're here.